Hey everybody, uh, so welcome back. We're on to topic 2.3. This is the exchange in the Indian Ocean Trade Network. And so today our central question is going to be identify and explain what caused the expansion of the Indian Ocean Trade Network, and then identify and explain the impacts of the expansion of trade in the Indian Ocean Network. So just like with Silk Roads, cause, effect. So the Indian Ocean Trade Network has been around for a long time. But it's going to expand much more after roughly about 600 CE, and that's, you know, rough estimation, right? And, um, you know, a lot of that is going to be connected to the spread of Islam. And when we talk about Islam in the past, Islam always is encouraging trade and, and, and exchange of goods as well as ideas. And so as a result, much of this, like, Arabic language, the Arabic writing becomes kind of lingua franca, the common language. Just as similar as English is kind of the language of business today. Um, and the merchants in East Africa, um, the Swahilis, um, they were kind of connected to this all the way to the you know, east coast of China in the uh, Indian Ocean, um, India subcontinent is part of this, Southeast Asia. So a lot of those um, areas and regions we talked about with our previous unit, you know, they still are there. And, and we're going to talk about some new ones that come about um, as a result of trade uh, as well. But each one of those, uh, you know, minus a few, are all kind of connected into this Indian Ocean Trade Network, and, and it just continues to expand more and more so. And so as a result, we'll get more powerful city-states and cities uh, and uh, that, have to, that are really tied into, like, the, the, their control and uh, management of this, this trade itself, okay? Um, and, and even though I should mention that there – a lot of these powerful city states and cities that um, come about and nobody really truly controls the entirety of the Indian Ocean trade network, right? It's, it's very different when we talk about the Mediterranean trade network um, where like, since we don't talk about this in our history class anymore, you know, at one time the Phoenicians controlled that trade and then and it was the Greek city states that controlled that trade and then the Romans and then you later will the Venetians and the Ottomans and we talk about, so there's always this competition in the Mediterranean where it is, you know, in the Indian Ocean, there's areas that are managed by certain states, but as a whole, nobody really truly controls it, even though the Europeans try to in, um, when they start showing up in this region. But even they weren't able to control the entirety of the Indian Ocean trade network, okay? So this is kind of what it looks like, uh, according to Ben Freeman, uh, and in a lot of different, uh, you know, the city-states that are, and cities that are, um, well, states in general that are part of this trade. And some of it we've already talked about. You can see here, like Srivijaya right here. Um, we'll talk about the um, Moroccan Sultanate as well. Um, that will come about here in a little while as well. But anyway, so just like any other trade network, you know, and, and a lot of things, we're talking about human environment interaction, like the knowledge of the the area in which you're trading it is really important, right? And in the case of the Indian Ocean, the geography of the Indian Ocean, they have monsoon winds. And the monsoon winds are going to um, be a major factor in, in navigating and, and trading along the Indian Ocean trade. During the winter months of October to March, you know, they blow from east to west. So if you're a sailor and you're intending to go westward, that's when you need to cast off because you want to catch those winds um, and the ability to to move to that part of the, the world and, and do your exchange. And then later times of the year, from April to September, they shift. They go from west to east. And so if you don't know this, if you don't know the exact day that you need to leave by in order to get back to where you intend to get back on, you're not getting there, okay? So this is going to have consequences on um, you know, some things, like you know, you'll get more cities that have are very cosmopolitan because people, you know, oftentimes have to stay there for the long haul. So getting second homes and then all the things that they would like to bring with them from home, those are things that are going to happen as a result of these environmental factors. But at the same time, it helps facilitate trade because the winds are very strong and they push them in the direction they want to go. And so knowledge of that and being able to take advantage of that does facilitate trade even more so. Improved technology uh, and commercial practices led to an increased volume of trade expanded in the geographical range of the existing trade routes, including the Indian Ocean, and promoting growth of powerful new cities. Okay, so this is very similar to what we talked about in the um, Silk Roads lecture, where you know, trade expands. As a result, you're going to get new powerful uh, city-states and so forth, 
And of course, technology plays a role in the expansion of that trade. So we're going to talk about expansion of trade technology. I and mean, the Lantine sales, we already talked about these triangular sales, you know, something that I'm no, not sure who actually invents these, but the Arabic um, you know, world definitely takes advantage of them. Um, and they're used uh, all along the Indian Ocean trade networks by different groups of people because it catches the wind much faster and, and much better um, and, you know, moves those ships along with all those goods, right? Stern runners are something from China that become of a important invention to allow the directional movement of the ships themselves. Dow ships, these are the types of ships that Arab and Indian sailors use. And you can see in this photo right here, that's like a small little Dow ship. There can be obviously bigger in terms of uh, moving materials across a long distance. Um, but those are things that, uh, you know, the type of ship that really dominated the Indian Ocean Trade Network for some time. And there's new technologies that are coming about during this time. The magnetic compass, the astrolabe, you know, those are uh, technologies that make it easier to navigate, to the, get to the places that you need to get to. Um, thus making it easier, safer, and more likely that people are going to do this. And so that's another reason why we see the expansion of trade as well. So it does foster the lead to new growths of city and states. And we're going to talk about a couple of examples here. Um, the increase, just like with Silk Roads, increased trade and movement and volume of trade and so forth ends up leading to where you have governments who need to oversee this, protect the trade, and then also tax the trade. And the taxing of the trade leads to those governments and uh, the people that are connected to them becoming more powerful and building these empires that can expand and their influence over larger geographical areas. Some examples from college boards, Swahili city states, the Gujarat, and the Sultanate of Malacca. Um, these are ones that we have not talked about in great detail from previous units, so we're going to dive into them a little bit more today. So there are very powerful city-states on the east coast of Africa. Sometimes the Arabic, uh, Arab, uh, Arabic world called it the Zanj Coast. Um, we call it the, it's the Swahili Coast. Swahili itself um, means the coasters, um, so they live along the coastline. But these are very powerful city-states that had connected into the interior of Africa to be able to get goods that you would find there. I and mean, Africa is a vast continent. It has lots of natural resources and such and, and luxury and exotic goods. So I'm going to give you some examples that are of bulk items that were traded, but there was a lot of things that were traded in all this network. So ivory, gold, slaves... Um, but they also had things like shells, feathers, rhino horns, and much, much more, I'm sure. But it's, um, you know, just some examples to give you to use and like what was involved with the Swahili Trade Coast. They, they, they traded these things, right? They brought in and, and, and imported from other places like cotton from India, cotton, cotton products, um, which they were uh, a big manufacturer of cotton goods. Our work, ironworks, porcelain came in from China. I mentioned, you know, when we talked about Africa in our first unit, the Great Zimbabwe, um, where it's in modern day Tanzania, you know, they were digging up artifacts that uh, you could trace all the way back to China. And because they were connected into the Indian Ocean Trade Network uh, through the Swahili city states themselves. Um, bringing a considerable amount of wealth and diversity and cultural exchange of these cities is cannot be overstated. And we're talking about college board. They love talking about cultural exchanges and interactions. In these city states, I mentioned where the winds, you know, push people. Say you're uh, from coming from Arabia and you're pushed during certain months towards uh, Africa, and so you set up shop in say Mombasa. And so in Mombasa, um, you if you don't leave in time, you're going to have to stay for a period of time, and that happened. And so what you end up having is these very cosmopolitan cities where you have um, people from Malaysia, you have people from China, you have people from India, you have people from Arabia, you know, all living in this city. And so they bring with them their culture, their values. There's an exchange of ideas. Um, you might see some conversion of uh, religious beliefs and so forth. But there's a lot of things that are going on here. And so if you go to a place like Zanzibar today, you have lots of different types of architectural styles that make up that island. Um, 
And it's a really, I mean, this is definitely on my top 10 places to visit at some point, Zanzibar, um, because of like the history of that island and how much of it was connected into the train networks. I mean, it's pretty much defined by the train networks and all the people that come from afar that link into this network itself. Okay. Um, so Mombasa, Kilawa are some other examples of, of train network cities that um, do exist uh, in, in the Swahili city-states. Okay, So um, Indian Ocean Train Network fostered the growth of states. So let's talk about a couple examples. Gujarat. This is a state uh, that was a, basically a Western Indian Rajput kingdom, one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful of its era. And a lot of its power is derived from its connection to the trade. And so they were able to tax the imported and exported goods that go through there. And then they connect into the interior of the sub or the subcontinent of India. And so they certainly, you know, get a lot of this and in and, and this area, this part of India, India is becoming one of the most populated, also one of the most like well built of the areas because they had the money to build these definitely architectural structures that uh, will last the, um, for a long time. Um, but the, the Rajaputs, you know, was a, 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 um, you know, a Hindu controlled kingdom. They would conflict with uh, the Islamic uh, kingdoms like the, the Sultanate of Delhi for control of this trade and so forth. Um, until like the um, um, descend, one of the sons of the Mughal, um, the Il Khanyate group and such a guy named Timurlane or Timur the Lame, um, weakened the Sultanate of Delhi, you know, around 1398. And so that kind of led for the, um, the Gujarat and the, uh, this kingdom to be able to kind of have a, um, a pretty good control over trade for some time then. Okay. Sultanate of Malacca. This is the, along the Strait of Malacca. We've talked about this in the past, how important this waterway is. It's a choke point, uh, for, if you are, a ship that's trying to get from India to China and vice versa, you've got to go through the Strait of Malacca or else there's really no viable option otherwise. And because you control that trade, uh, then you can tax the heck out of it. And so we've talked about previous empires that have come about and that have control over the Strait of Malacca. One in particular is Sri Vijayan Empire. And the Sri Vijayans were a very massive empire. And, you know, it also becomes kind of a middle uh ground for if you didn't want to go all the way to India or all the way to the um, you know, Arabic coast or the Swahili coast and such, um, a lot of goods would come over here and they'd be exchanged in this kind of area where everyone's got to go through if they're trying to get to China or India or wherever. So, you know, this most likely started uh, as a small diaspora community of, of Muslim traders that eventually rose to the, the sense of power where they controlled um, areas and territories um, directly um, and through a system of, of governors. But they also had vassal states because of their very powerful navy. They can control the ports that kind of were in this region. And so they would expect tribute from these vassal states as they would collect and trade along this coastline of um, the Strait of Malacca as well. So this is something, I mean, this, this Sultanate of Malacca will um, come around the 1400s and then they'll kind of lose its power over time um, to Europeans. Um, and when they arrived, the Dutch in particular, um, no, sorry, Portuguese, one of the two, maybe both, um, that uh, end up playing a huge role in kind of uh, transforming the region as well. But the Strait of Malacca, another good example of a powerful trading state that uh, derives its power from the Indian Ocean trade networks directly, okay? The growth of interregional inter trade in luxury goods was encouraged by significant innovations in previously existing transportation and commercial technologies, including the use of the compass, the astrolabe, and larger ship designs, something I've already really addressed already. Here are some goods that are going to be traded along the Indian Ocean trade work network. Um, so if you, you know, for whatever reason, I'm always looking for like strong examples. Okay. So if you can think of strong examples, what was traded, here's a list of plenty of examples for you. Okay. Uh, but I'm not going to read each one to keep the video short. You have the access to the PowerPoint already. All right. 
In key places uh, among the trade routes, merchants set up diasporic communities where they introduce their own cultural traditions, indigenous cultures, and in turn, indigenous cultures influence the merchant cultures. This is something I was talking about with the Swahili city states, right? So we have these communities. Diaspora communities are basically groups of people that have an ethnic identity that move to another area. And even though they live in that other area, they still hold themselves like a very much to the same cultural identity as the place that they came from. But in doing so, like they will also find their way exchanging ideas and, and trading, um, exchanging cultural um, with the people that live in there already and so forth. So that's where they get those cosmopolitan cities. So there's some examples uh, that College Board gives of this is something where you have a lot of cross-cultural cross exchange from groups that should uh, to move Arab and Persian communities in East Africa. And you, you will find lots of Muslim communities in um you know indonesia indonesia today the fourth most populated country in the world um the majority population or majority religion i should say is islam um so you know that's only possible because of you know these diaspora communities that set up and then over time um have uh created a large influence over these regions chinese merchants in southeast asia you know today singapore which is one of the most powerful and wealthiest cities in the world might be one of the most wealthiest states in the world. It's a giant sea state um, on an island uh, right at the end of Malacca. Let's see if I can find it. It's sick right in here. Um, but this is, uh, you know, made up uh, the people who live there. A lot of them can trace their their lineage, their uh, family history back to Chinese merchants who left China because in Confucian China, um, you know, the Confucius religion kind of views the Chinese merchants or the merchants in general as being lower on the this totem pole of society because they take from somebody else the, and, and, and exchange it rather than building something themselves. So like farmers were held in higher regard and respect in, in China um, than merchants were. And so they moved to a different place where merchants play a humongous role in shaping that. And, and especially when you're living amongst uh, people who are Islamic, um, where they have a higher degree of respect for merchants themselves. And of course, Malay communities are going to be found all across the Indian Ocean network, um, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, uh, India, the Swahili city states, um, the Omani coast of, of Arabia. So yeah, they're just all over. And so these are some examples of these communities that spread out away from their homelands along this chain network. Interregional conflicts, or sorry, contacts and conflicts between states and empires encourage significant technological exchange, cultural transfers, including during Chinese maritime activity led by Ming Admiral Jin Ha. So Jin Ha is a Muslim uh, who is um, going to get the support of the Ming Dynasty. And the Ming Dynasty is one that replaces the Yuan Dynasty. After the Yuans essentially lose the Mandate of Heaven, um, there's a rebellion, and from that, the Mings end up becoming the, um, the family that controls China or rules China for some time period. And the Mings themselves... Um, they are trying to find reestablish China as being kind of like the center of the universe. And a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm going to overgeneralize here. So uh, I apologize if this is, um, you know, way too oversimplified. But the Chinese, for much of their history, have always viewed themselves as the center of the universe and that the uh, surrounding peoples are potential tributary states and that they should pay tribute to the, the larger, more powerful Chinese civilization. We talked about this with Korea and Japan, how they become tributary states to China. Well, the Muslim or the uh, the Ming Empire, um, Ming Dynasty, is looking for an expansion of the tributary states. So here comes Jin Ha, and he's going to build this gigantic fleet of of ships. Um, you know, and you have here's the treasure fleet, as it's called, um, and they are going to go out on voyages looking for potential tributary states, uh, enroll more people, and and states into this tributary system itself. Um, and he brings back a lot of stuff, a lot of goods, a lot of uh, ideas, some peoples and so forth. Um, he's able to, to kind of set up some tributary system with a lot of these uh, markets, 
So China expands its influence in markets across the Indian Ocean trade network because of Jin Ha. And it's not just because of him, but he certainly plays a massive role in expanding that uh, very largely. I mean, look at this ships. I mean, how do you not like look in on un, what uh, awe and wonder at the technological like marvel that is this giant sheep uh, sheep uh, fleet of ships. I must be getting tired today. But anyway, um, regardless of all the things that he brings, and, and he brings exotic animals. Here, I'm just going to, I'm moving around a lot here. Here's the exotic animals. Like, here's an example of, like, you know, they brought a giraffe back uh, on his fourth voyage and so forth. Um, and they bring a lot of goods. I mean, look at how big these ships are. This is Jin Ha's treasure ship, um, you know, where he kind of, uh, his flagship. This is the ship itself, and this is, uh, and to give you some idea of the scale, this is the Santa Maria. This is the ship that Christopher Columbus uh, was his flagship as he sailed across uh, the ocean blue in 1492 to, uh, to land into what becomes uh, the, the American continent, or in the Caribbean, really. But that is like, you know, it gives you an idea of how massive these ships were. They even had farms, uh, and they can grow crops on these ships so that they could feed the the sailors as our part of this fleet, right? Really incredible technological wonder, and it's too bad that more people don't know more about Jin Ha here in the West. But there is definitely some controversy in I mean, China as a result of his uh, these uh, expeditions that he's taking. You know, a lot of Confucian scholars um, were worried about all the foreign influence that he was bringing back with them. And xenophobia is a very powerful emotion, and, and you know, a lot of people do not like that foreign influence, thinking that it, uh, it weakens their strength of their civilization and so forth. And so, yeah, he gets some pushback from some Confucian scholars as a result of like all of the cultural things that he's bringing back with him. The voyage was very expensive, and so like to justify him, he had to bring back lots of stuff, and, and some expeditions he wasn't able to get uh, as much new things as, as he'd hoped, but, you know, that just goes without the cost of business. Um, eventually, the voyages were stopped by the um, son of the Chinese emperor that, and I don't, at the top of my head, don't remember the names, but um, they are able to, or they, they basically forbid him from continuing his expeditions, and they also forbid Chinese in general from sailing away from China. Feeling, fearing that that whole foreign influence would then change the Chinese civilization. And so a lot, this leads to a lot of discussion. What if China had ever done this? Would China be kind of the dominant civilization in the world? That's like an interesting conversation, not what I'm going to chime in and what I think. But, um, you know, there there is something to be said that the Chinese, like when they stop doing this, um, is about the time where the Europeans start to arrive in the Indian Ocean. And had the Europeans, uh, led by Vasco da Gama, it start with uh, Portuguese, um, there's no way they would have been able to, to do what they do if it hadn't been, been for the Chinese getting rid of this giant fleet of ships that could definitely have uh, brought the pain uh, to the um, Europeans who come in and try to take control over the Indian Ocean Network, right? Um, and so, yeah, here are all of his this, this, uh, uh, voyages. And yeah, that's like, I mean, he goes all over. He gets a lot of stuff, brings it back to China. It's important. He's one of the important travelers of this time. All right, so that's the Indian Ocean Network in a nutshell. And so here we go, central question, identify and explain what caused the expansion of the Indian tra Ocean Trade Network, and then explain the impacts of it as well, okay? So make sure you submit that on Canvas. Next, we'll be doing the Trans-Saharan Trade Network with 2.4, and so I'll see you then.